The devil hates everything about Christmas. He hates the love, the joy, and the peace that surround the coming of the King. He is truly the original Mr. Grinch, and he wants to steal the wonder of your Christmas. I'm Pastor Jeff Shreve, and today we're going to learn how to enjoy Christmas to the full and keep the devil at bay. When I was a kid growing up, back in the day, we didn't have cable TV, we didn't have Blu-ray, no such thing as tapes or CDs or DVDs. We didn't have any of that stuff. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have streaming. We had network television, CBS. ABC, NBC, a couple of UHF stations. If you were totally desperate, PBS, but you didn't want to watch that. That was terrible. But it was, it was appointment TV. You know, we have this stuff called on demand. Whenever you want, you can watch what you want on demand. Back in the 60s, 70s, it wasn't on demand. It was appointment television. And the network told you, this is when we're airing X, and if you don't watch it when it comes on at 7.30, you didn't get to see it. And so as a little kid growing up and excited about Christmas time, we, we would look through. You know, they had the TV guide. They would print it in the newspaper, and then you could buy a magazine. It was TV guide. It would show you all the things that were on and when they were on because it was appointment television. Well, as a kid, we looked and zeroed in on the, the cartoon Christmas movies that we, we never got to see. They only showed them one time a year at Christmas time. And so there were the, the epic uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer cartoon. And for a little kid, that was a lot of fun to watch. And then Frosty the Snowman, that was a lot of fun to watch. And the Merry Christmas, Charlie Brown, we watched that. But probably the, the number one uh, Christmas cartoon movie was How the Grinch Stole Christmas. That, that was the best, Dr. Seuss. And uh, that show was what we looked forward to seeing. You only, you only saw it once a year, and so you really looked forward to it. And if you remember the Dr. Seuss How the Grinch Stole Christmas, it was all about this mean, old, cruel, uh, crusty Grinch that lived up way up in a cave uh, above Whoville, and he hated Christmas, and he wanted to stop Christmas from coming. Now, the song that Dr. Seuss wrote about the Grinch is legendary. It was sung by a man named Thurl Ravencroft. You say, who is that? He was the voice for 50 years of Tony the Tiger, for Frosted Flakes, and he sang the song, and I wanted to just uh, give you an idea of what the Grinch was like. You're a foul one, Mr. Grinch. You're a nasty, wasty skunk. Your heart is full of unwashed socks. Your soul is full of gunk, Mr. Grinch. The three words that best describe you are as follows, and I quote, stink, stank, stunk. You're a rotter. Mr. Grinch. I had to look up what rotter was. That's a cruel, unkind, stingy person. You're the king of sinful sots. Sot is a drunk. Your heart's a dead tomato splotched with moldy purple spots, Mr. Grinch. Your soul is an appalling dump heap overflowing with the most disgraceful assortment of deplorable rubbish imaginable, mangled up in tangled up knots. Awful. You nause nauseate me, Mr. Grinch, with a nauseous super nos. You're a crooked jerky jockey, and you drive a crooked hoss, Mr. Grinch. You're a three-decker sauerkraut and toadstool sandwich with arsenic sauce. <laughs> Obviously, Dr. Seuss didn't like the Grinch. But now, the Grinch is a picture of the devil. 
The Grinch hated Christmas. He wants to steal Christmas from the people that are so excited about Christmas. The devil is the exact same way. He's a thief. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. Now, the devil hates everything about Christmas. Because Christmas, we celebrate the coming of the Messiah, the long-awaited. We sang that song, Come Thou Long-Expected Jesus. And the, the Old Testament saints were waiting for their Messiah, and it seemed so long. But he came in the fullness of time. He came at the proper time. And when he finally comes, there is, for those who believe, there is great excitement and uh, cheer and, wow, the Messiah has come. And so the devil hates everything about that. He hates the songs. He hates the spirit. He hates the cheer. He hates the message. He hates the, the news, the good news. And so he wants to steal that celebration from your heart and mine. Now, he can't keep Christmas from coming, just like the Grinch couldn't keep Christmas from coming. But what he can do is he can steal Christmas from you. He can steal the spirit of Christmas from you. And so maybe you're here today and you're saying, you know, uh, this Christmas is just not going to be a good Christmas for me. I mean, I've gone through some heartache and trials and pain. I've lost a loved one. It's just not going to be the same. I'm just, I'm just wanting to get through the holidays. You know, you hear people say, that, just get through the holidays. When I do a wedding, I'll, I'll talk to uh, the couple and I say, now, listen, here's the thing. You want to enjoy this because so many people, uh, the couples, they get there and they get right up to the wedding and they just, I just can't wait for this to be over. Just want to get through it. And it's like, you've been waiting your whole life for this time. Enjoy it. Don't just want to get through it. Enjoy it and treasure the moments that you have. And uh, the devil doesn't want you to do that. He wants to steal that from you. And the big question is, are you letting him do it? Or is your heart filled with the spirit of Christmas? Well, in Luke chapter 1, just a few verses, verses 39 through 45, we have the, the account of Mary, who had just been visited by the angel Gabriel, told that she's going to bear the Christ child, and she responds and says, well, how can this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel tells her, well, the power of the Most High is going to overshadow you, and you're going to have a holy offspring. He's going to be called the Son of God. And she responds, and she says, behold, the bond slave of the Lord, the, the doulos of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. Now, the angel had given her a, a, a little bit of encouragement in that he said, and here's a sign for you, your relative, distant cousin, your relative Elizabeth, who was barren. Elizabeth was somewhere in between 60 to 84. She's advanced in years. We don't know how old she is. She never had any kids. She couldn't have any kids. She was barren. She was sterile. And so if, if we say that advanced in years can be anywhere from 60 to 84, I'm 60, and so we're not going to say she was 60. We're going to say she was older than that. Uh, so most Bible scholars would say she's probably in her 70s, probably about 75. Can you imagine at 75 having a baby? Well, she was pretty excited about it, but it was there's like, whoa, this is pretty exciting, and uh, it's also a lot. And so the angel Gabriel tells Mary, now, your relative is in her sixth month, and she who is called barren is having a son, for nothing will be impossible with God. And so when Mary hears that news and says, behold, the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word, then the scripture says this, verse 39 of Luke chapter 1, now at this time... Mary arose and went with haste to the hill country, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it came about when, that when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed among women are you, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me? that the mother of my Lord should come to me. 
For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Three insights that I want you to see wrapped around the question, are you letting the devil steal your Christmas? Insight number one, the devil is a thief, as Jesus said, who wants to steal your joy. Now, as we read that account, what jumps off the page is the joy, the joy of John the Baptist, six months in the womb. He had so much joy. He was leaping for joy, jumping for joy. And the story of Jesus and the coming of Jesus is joy. The coming of Jesus, as the angel said to the shepherds, for I bring you good news of a great joy which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So we talk about the joy of Christmas because it is a joyful time. Now I want you to think about this. So here is Mary, and she receives the message, Behold the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. And immediately, she takes off to see her relative Elizabeth. Because for Mary, you know, you ask the question, well, why did you immediately go see Elizabeth? There wasn't anybody who would believe her and her story. Joseph, who was betrothed to her, well, he didn't believe her. How could you believe the story? I'm pregnant, but it's not what you think. Well, yeah, it is. I mean, no, no, the, the power of the Most High came upon me. Now, if, as parents, if, you're, if your daughter told you that, you'd be like, I ain't buying that, you know? Uh, that's not how that works. And so she knew nobody's going to believe me except Elizabeth because she's had a miracle too. So she leaves Nazareth. Now, remember, Mary's about 14 years old, 15 years old, probably at the, at the max. She leaves Nazareth and makes the long journey to go to the hill country in Judah. It's about an 80-mile trek between where she is in the north in Nazareth to go way down south to Jerusalem or even deeper, even uh, all the way down to, to Hebron. And so it's a long journey that she has to make. It's very unusual for a young girl like that to make the journey. She probably went with some other people or had some other people go with her. Uh, we don't know. But she went in haste. And she is freshly pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And I don't read where there was any feeling with that. It's just the word that the angel gave to her. But as soon as she enters into Elizabeth's house and gives a greeting, the baby leaps for joy in her womb. And then Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit, and she had joy from the baby having joy from Mary being there who was carrying the baby Jesus and just so fresh in her pregnancy. Man, it is an exciting time. The coming of Jesus is good news of a great joy. And the coming of Jesus is a joy that trumps every trial, every trouble, every problem, every heartache, every pain. When you get your eyes off your troubles and problems and heartaches and pain, and you think about the Savior and get your mind on Him, that just trumps everything. Now, Paul, in prison, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, wrote these words in the uh, ERV version, always be filled with joy in the Lord. I will say it again, be filled with joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Now, when you're in prison in Rome, it's not, not really an exciting place to be. It's not where Paul wanted to be. You know, he says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me so I can handle any situation that he puts me in because he gives me strength. It's not where he wanted to be, but even in the midst of bad circumstances, he could choose to rejoice in the Lord. My friend Charles Lowry, who has preached at our church and, and done conferences at our church, he's got a, another marriage conference in, uh, in March that's coming up, and, and he will be uh, speaking again. That's Fred Lowry's brother. 
He and his family went through the, the tragedy and the heartache and heartbreak of losing a grandson at two years old in a tragic, tragic accident. And Charles uh, said to me when we were doing a radio program together, he said, you know, in life, sometimes you can't rejoice in the circumstances because the circumstances are bad, but you can always rejoice in the Lord. You can always find your joy in the Lord. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Now, those aren't people watching us. Those are people who have gone before us, Hebrews 11, the hall of the faithful, and we have their testimonies there for us to say, hey, they made it through. They trusted God. They're the hall of the faithful, and, and their testimonies are surrounding us. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus." the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. How did Jesus get through the horrors and the agony and the excruciating pain of the cross physically, mentally, emotionally, and most of all, spiritually. How did he get through that? Who for the joy set before him. He had the joy set before him. He was seeing what was on the other side. That's how he got through it. He wasn't focusing in on the, the difficulty. He was focusing in on the Lord, his Father. He was focusing in on what this was going to produce, and he was paving the way for us to come to know him in a real and personal way and spend forever with him. As the song says, while he was on the cross, you were on his mind. And so what do we do with that? You're here and you're going through heartache and, and pain and difficulties and, and things are just so hard for you right now and you say, I don't have any joy. How do I find joy? Well, you get your eyes off your problems and you get your eyes on the Lord and when you can't rejoice in circumstances, you rejoice in him. We lose our joy, and the devil, we allow the devil to steal it from us when we start to focus in on all the difficulties of life. And when that happens, we need to recognize it. Hey, the devil's got me distracted, and I need to get my eyes back on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. So the devil, number one, is the thief who wants to steal your joy. And secondly, the devil is a thief who wants to steal your blessings. Not just your joy, but to steal your blessings. Now, in the account we just read, the, the things that jump out at me, joy, because John the Baptist is leaping for joy. And may I just say, John the Baptist at six months in the womb is a person. He's a person, just like he was six months out of the womb, just like he was when he was 30 years old conducting his ministry. Jesus is freshly conceived, and he's a person. Life begins at conception. And so we stand for life. Why? Because life begins at conception, and those little babies... John the Baptist, here's something so cool. So he has a job, and it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 15, that he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And there's the evidence of that. And his job as the forerunner of Christ is to pave the way for the Lord Jesus and point uh, the people to the Lord Jesus. And he starts his job six months in the womb. Man, that's starting early, right? I mean, you hadn't even been out of the womb yet, and you're doing your job, and he's letting his mother know, this is the one. You know, Mary didn't tell Elizabeth. When it says she greeted Elizabeth, she didn't come in there and say, Elizabeth, it's me, Mary, I'm pregnant, but it's by the Holy Spirit. That's not, that, that's not her lead foot, right? So she just comes in and says, Elizabeth, it's me, Mary, and boom, there's a greeting, and there's the excitement, and the baby is leaping for joy, and then Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. Blessed 
among women are you, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. So these ladies are together, two pregnant ladies, and there's joy and there's blessing. And the devil is a thief who wants to steal your blessing. Now, Mary is blessed among women. She's not blessed above women. We have people that want to deify Mary. Mary is a, she's just a, a simple 15-year-old, very common, ordinary girl that's betrothed to Joseph, and she lives in Nazareth, a grease spot town, a blinking yellow light, and the Lord notices her, the Lord chooses her, but she's a sinner, and she needs a Savior. And she says in verse 47, my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior, because she needs a Savior. And so she's blessed among women, not above women, but among women, not because of her, but because of the fruit in her womb, because she is going to bear the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Elizabeth gives this blessing. Blessed among women are you, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. The word for blessed that she uses in verse 42 is uh, the word that, that we get eulogy from. And to, to eulogize someone is to speak well of them. And so she is speaking well of Mary, and she's speaking well of the baby. And there are great blessings. The verse that she, or the word for blessed that's used in verse 45 is a different word. It's makarios. That's the word that Jesus used when he preached the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. Uh, that, mean, that word means to be exceedingly happy and favored by God. And so Christmas is a time of blessings. Now, joy is real specific. Blessings cover the gamut of all the things that God wants to do in our lives, the good things that he wants to give us. So we have to be aware that the devil wants to steal your blessings. He wants to steal the blessedness that comes from the Christmas story, from the good news of a great joy. So remember this, all blessings come from the Lord. If you've been blessed in any way, it's from the Lord. The Bible says in James 1.17, every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. God is the blesser, and he blesses us even when we don't deserve it. He just, that's just who he is. Some people say, well, you know, I did it. I made it on my own. I'm a self-made man. Uh, God didn't do any of this. I did it myself. Oh, yeah? Well, who gave you the strength to do it? Who gave you the ability to do what you did? Who gave you the, the brain power to do what you did? The Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Why? Because the breath in your lungs is a gift from God. It's a blessing from God. God doesn't owe you anything. He doesn't owe me anything. He just gives because he's a good God. And all blessings given must be believed to be fully received. So Mary is blessed. Why? Verse 45, blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. She believed God. And as I told you, when the angel said, the power of the Most High will overshadow you, you know, we like to think that, you know, it's kind of like when God does a miracle, you know, it's going to be uh, abracadabra, alakazam, you know, he's going to say something or he's going to wave his hand or something like that. No, it would, how does Jesus do miracles? A lot of times he would just say, go, your son is healed. There's no, where's, where's, where's the rabbit? Pull the rabbit out of your hat. Do something that would be like, uh, you see that sign in the sky? There's, there's a, you know, a meteor that flies through the sky. Your son is healed. You know, and, and then it's like, yeah, that, I saw that. He doesn't do that. And so when the angel Gabriel told her, you're going to have a son, the power of the Most High is going to overshadow you, I don't think there was any sign. There was not any feeling. She didn't feel different. She's not all of a sudden, you know, in a convulsion state and like, oh, I know this happened. No, it's just, uh, okay. 
be it done to me according to your word. She gets confirmation from Elizabeth, who got confirmation from John the Baptist. And then the Holy Spirit begins to work. The baby leaps in Elizabeth's womb, and then she's filled with the Holy Spirit. And then she realizes and says the thing she says to Mary. And then Mary gets that confirmation from the Lord, I really am pregnant. Now, I've never been pregnant. And apart from what the liberals in our world believe, men don't get pregnant. Hey, you know, uh, that's just, it ain't going to happen, right? Um, but I know as Debbie's gone through four pregnancies, and so I know that, uh, you know, at the first, you don't know. So you're taking tests. Why? Because you don't know if you're pregnant. So if, you're just, if you've just been pregnant for, uh, after conception, maybe it's been 10 days, you wouldn't know. And there's nothing outward that, that's going to show you that. So she just believed the word. And blessings given must be believed in order to be received. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. You remember when Jesus was at the tomb of Lazarus and he told Martha, roll away the stone? Lord, I don't want to roll away the stone. He's been dead for four days. Lord, he, he stinks. He's not just dead. He's stinking dead. And Jesus said, did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Roll away the stone. If you believe, you'll see the glory of God. Now, how do you know that she believed? They rolled away the stone. That's how you know that you really believe. There's action to the belief. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. How do we know that Abraham believed God? Because he left his home of Ur of the Chaldees and he went to where the Lord told him to go, to the promised land, to Canaan land. That's how we know he believed God. You say you believe God and you don't act upon that, you don't really believe. And so... If you believe, you will see the glory of God. Romans 15, 13, favorite verse of mine. We're calling this series The Thrill of Hope. What does the Bible say about hope? Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. How do you have all joy and peace? It comes in believing. And if you don't believe, you won't have all joy and peace. Did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. If you believe, you will have all joy and peace, and your heart will be filled with hope. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, a great verse. It says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, who has blessed us. It doesn't say who will bless us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. It says he's already done it. He has already blessed us with every spiritual blessing, not material blessing, although material blessings uh, often come to us, but it's a spiritual blessing, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. And God has already done that for his children. So let's take peace because we talk a lot about peace at Christmas time. Do you have peace? You say, no, I don't have peace. You're a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, he's already blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Why don't you have peace? I don't know. I don't have it. I, I wish I could get it. I don't have it. Let me illustrate this with a story I heard years ago. It was in an Adrian Rogers sermon. I loved this story, and Adrian loved it too. He told it many, many times, and it was a situation that happened at his church when Peter Lord was there, Peter Lord, a great Bible teacher. And so Peter Lord came to do a conference, and they had a break in the conference, and Peter Lord went to Gene Howard, who was the chairman of the deacons at Bellevue, and said, hey, I need to do an illustration. I want to show an illustration when we come back from the break. And so he said, I'm going to call on your wife. And he said, uh, make sure when I call her up to the platform that you get her to bring her Bible. And so Peter Lord took a $5 bill out of his pocket and he tucked it in her Bible. 
And then he, everybody got back and he said uh, to the crowd, I need somebody to help me with this illustration. He looked around and looked around and, you know, just like he was just, you know, on a whim. Oh, you, dear lady, you come up here. And so he picked Betty Howard, Jean's wife, just, you know, it was a setup. And so she started coming up and Jean said to her, honey, don't you think you need to take your Bible? She goes, oh, yeah, I need my Bible. So she comes up there. And she's there on the platform in front of all the people with Peter Lord. And Peter Lord said to her, uh, now your name's Betty Howard. She said, yes, it's Betty Howard. He said, now I'm going to ask you some questions. Betty, do you believe I'm a man of God? Well, what could she say? She's up in front of everybody. She can't say no. So she says, yes, yes, I believe you're a man of God. She said, he said, do you believe I tell the truth? She said, yes, I do. He said, do you love me? She said, yes, I love you. He said, do you trust me? She said, yes, I trust you. He said, well, if you believe I'm a man of God and you believe I tell the truth and you love me and you trust me, if I were to ask you to do something for me that you could do right here, standing right here, wouldn't cost you anything and you could do it for me, would you do it? And she said, well, sure, I would do it. He said, wonderful. Give me $5. She said, okay, well, let me go. I got to go back to my purse. He said, no, 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 no. I didn't say anything about going to get your purse. I said you could do it right here, right now. Give me $5. She said, well, I, I, gotta, I got to go back to my purse. He said, wait a minute, let's start over. Do you love me? Yes. Do you trust me? Yes. Do you believe that I would lie to you? No, I don't believe you would lie to me. Do, do you believe that I would tell you you could do something when you couldn't do it? She said, no. He said, great. Then give me $5. She said, well, I don't have $5. How am I going to give you $5? I don't have $5. He says, is that your Bible? She said, yes. And he takes, may I have it? Yes. He opens it up, pulls out a $5 bill. Says, why didn't you give this to me? She said, well, who put that in there? He said, I put it in there. And the only thing I asked you to give to me was what I had already given to you. What was her problem? She didn't know that that was in there. What's the problem that so many of us have? We don't know what's in here. We don't know what God has promised. And so if you don't know that you have been given this huge sum in your spiritual bank account, you don't write checks off of it. And so what do you do? What do you pray for? You pray for patience. Lord, I'm so stressed out. Lord, please give me patience. And God says, I've already given you all that. It's in your account. You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Lord, I need peace. I just need peace. Well, I already gave that to you. That that was in there when I saved you. And so instead of asking me for what I've already given you, why don't you access by faith what I've already given to you. What does it say? And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Now, we hear people pray this all the time. I've probably been guilty of praying this. You know, we pray, and Lord, be with this person and be with that person and be with the other person. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So why do we pray for Jesus to be with that person when Jesus has already said, I'm with that person? That doesn't make sense. Now, you can pray, Lord, help that person to really experience your nearness so that they would be aware. I prayed that this morning, that people would be aware of God's presence in this place as we sang his praises and as we preached his word. That's a good prayer to pray. Lord, help them to experience your manifest presence. I need to experience your manifest presence because just just because God is with me doesn't mean I feel his presence. It's nice to feel the Lord's presence. Debbie and I in our marriage, we love each other, but sometimes we feel so in love. And other times we love each other. Does you get the difference? We don't feel it. But we still love each other. And in, in our relationship with the Lord, there are times, you know, your relationship with the Lord is a lot like, uh, like your relationship with your spouse. It's a dynamic. It's, it doesn't just, it's not static. It, it goes up and down. And you can be doing really well, and then you're not doing so well. 
And so, Lord, I want to feel, I want the passion, I want the emotions there. Even when they're not there, Lord, I love you, but it's so wonderful when they're there. And see, if we will start to pray and we start to claim, you know, you've heard that name it and claim it. Well, we can't name it and claim it. God has to name it. And when God names it, then you can claim it. Then you can believe it and say, Lord, you promise. God loves it when we do that. He loves it when we pray his word back to him and say, well, Lord, you promised your peace. You said I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. So I'm writing a check right now and cashing in on the peace that you said is in my account. And so I'm trusting you for it. Isaiah 26, verse 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. The devil wants to steal your joy. He wants to steal your blessings. And lastly, the devil is a thief who was defeated at the cross. We need to remember that. He's a thief who was defeated at the cross. Now, Genesis chapter 3, the fall of man when the Lord comes down after Adam and Eve had been deceived, or Eve deceived by the serpent, Adam uh, ate with her. He wasn't deceived, but he ate with her, and they, they fell, and the Lord comes down. Adam, Adam, where are you? I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord says to Eve, what is this that you have done? The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And then the Lord says to the serpent, he curses the serpent, and he says in Genesis 3.15, it's called the proto-eongelion, the, the first gospel, the first piece of good news, and it was spoken to the serpent, to the devil. And he says, it says that the seed of the woman is coming, and you will bite him on the heel and he's going to crush your head. Genesis 3, 15. Now, when did that happen? When the Lord came, born of a virgin, the seed of a woman, because a man wasn't involved in his birth, and the seed of the woman grew up, and the seed of the woman went to the cross, and the seed of the woman said, it is finished, paid in full, and he breathed his last. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And when he died on the cross, he crushed the serpent's head. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And so Jesus won the victory for us when he died and rose again. And we walk in his victory as we resist the devil by faith. See, the devil is a defeated foe. Jesus defeated him. He crushed his head. And to the Christian, the devil has no power. 1 John 4, 4, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And so the devil has no power over us. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. He can't steal from you unless you let him. He can't kill you. He can't destroy you. Your soul is secure in the Lord. But now the devil doesn't give up. Just because he can't uh, steal your soul and send you to hell, he can steal your joy, he can steal your peace, he can steal your blessings, but he can only do that if you let him. And see, as we walk in the victory the Lord gave us and we resist the devil, then the Bible says he flees from us. Peter said this, be of sober spirit, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He wants to gobble you up. But resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. You resist him. How do you do it? Firm in your faith. You believe the word. You believe what God says. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And as the scripture says in James chapter 4, but God gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Resist the devil. That means you stand up to the devil. And when you stand up to the devil firm in your faith, standing on the word of God, what does he do? He flees. 
And that's how you do battle with the enemy. We submit to God. Lord, I'm going to do it your way. Uh, not my will, but yours be done. And I put myself under your, your lordship. And I allow the Holy Spirit to fill me. And then I stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And he has to flee. Hey, is the devil stealing your Christmas? Is he stealing your joy? Are you letting him do it? Stealing your joy, stealing your peace, stealing your love, stealing your excitement. Have you taken your eyes off of Jesus and put them on your troubles and put them on your problems? Are you losing hope for a better tomorrow? Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me close with this story. I have a very dear and wonderful friend. I've known him since college, Sean Breedlove. And Sean has a wonderful wife, Deanne, and they got married uh, soon after college. I have a picture of Sean and his wife, Deanne. There they are. Sean helped disciple me when I was a college student. He's a couple years older than I am. Well, Sean and Deanne have three wonderful, beautiful children. Uh, they have Allie, their oldest, and Ben, their second born, and then Jake. And Jake is a world-class uh, wave boarder. Uh, and they competes in competitions and all this stuff. But uh, their middle son or their, their middle child, Ben, was born with a heart issue. And after about four months, they diagnosed this, what they thought was a heart murmur, but it ended up being something much more serious. And they were told early on that uh, people that have what Ben have, they don't live real long. And so probably... You know, in Ben's teens, uh, he's not going to make it. They were told that early on. And Sean said, you know, we, we didn't want to live in, in grief or anything like that. And we said, we're not going to borrow trouble. And what hasn't come, uh, we're just going to live in the now. And we're going to enjoy every day with Ben. We don't know how long we have with him, but we're going to enjoy every day with him. And Ben had a couple of episodes where he, uh, near-death experiences, where he would die and he would not be breathing for a while, his heart not beating, and then they would revive him. Well, when he was 18 years old, Christmas Day, 2011, he died. It was in the evening. They had had a wonderful day. I asked Sean, I said, did you know, did you sense that he was really going down where this would be his last day? He said, no, not at all. It was a total shock. He said, we rushed to the hospital Christmas night, 2011. He said, the doctors did what they could, but they came out and said, we, we can't save him. He's gone. And so they had to hear that news. Your 18-year-old son is gone Christmas night. He had to tell the, the two children, Allie and Jake, that their brother had died. He said it was the hardest thing they had ever done. And he said, we left as a family without our son. We left him there at the hospital. When I was interviewing Sean, and Sean's not a guy that cries, but he just broke down. And he was choking back the tears. He said, it was the darkest time of my whole life leaving that hospital that night. But unbeknownst to Sean and Deanne, Ben had had an experience with the Lord in one of those near-death experiences just a few weeks before he died. And he experienced the peace of what he calls the waiting room of heaven. He did a little three-by-five card thing where he just flipped these cards and was asking, do you believe in God? I sure do, and told his story. Well, that thing went viral, and it was the next day that a friend came and talked to Sean and Deanne and said, have you seen the video? And they said, what video? They said, the YouTube video of your son, Ben. They said, no, and they watched it, and they watched how Ben had said, I experienced such tremendous peace. I just want to go back there so badly. I never wanted to leave. I just can't wait to get back to that place. And Sean said it was so comforting for him and for Deanne and for 
Allie and Jake to know that their brother was safe and secure in heaven. They knew that intellectually. They knew that spiritually. But just to see him sharing that, that has been viewed by over 9 million people. It went all the way around the world. Sean and Deanne have been interviewed on CNN and uh, all sorts of news outlets. Allie wrote a book about it, When Will the Heaven Begin, about Ben's story. And I asked Sean this question. I said, Sean, so your oldest son dies on Christmas. I said, is that ruined Christmas for you? All the Christmases, is that all you think about? He said, no, not at all. He said, it's a matter of perspective. He said, I don't look at Christmas 2011 as the day that my son died. I look at that as the day that my son went to heaven. And I rejoice in that. <laughs> Sean and Deanne, they've chosen, and Allie and Jake, they've chosen to fix their eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Hey, there's joy in the coming of Jesus. There's love, there's peace, there are all the blessings of God wrapped up in swaddling clothes and placed there in the manger. And you and I can put our faith and trust in Him. And no matter what is taking place, He is the God of hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and all peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. My friend, as we come to the close of the broadcast, I want to ask you, do you know for certain that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior? If not, today is the day for you. Just ask the Lord from your heart, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself, but I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me to come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you, and I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in, and your life will never be the same. We would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this program to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please contact me, and we will help you and pray for you.